Let's pray together. God, there's nothing like your word. It was from eternity past, and it will never pass away. Not a jot or a tittle of it will ever pass away until Christ comes back. God, help us to hide your word in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. Help us to be a, a light unto our path, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119. And God, help us revive us with it, Lord. Use it mightily in our lives. We thank you for a time to sing unto you. We thank you for a time to gather as your people and to worship together. God, be glorified. May your son be lifted up now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's sermon is called Eternal Life. Eternal Life. And we're going to be in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. The Word of God. The mighty Word of God. What happened was that the Word of God left heaven. And He became flesh. He became incarnate. None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He tabernacled among us, or among them. From the beginning, even before the material universe came into being, even before that, the Word was. The Word existed. And Jesus Christ is none other than the embodiment of the truth, or of what is true. And the Gospel came. The gospel, the good news came. It comes to our community for us to hear it. The gospel, the good news came even to our neighborhood for us to hear it and for us to spread the word around. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. The one whom Jesus loved was carried along by the Holy Spirit to write this. He wrote the gospel of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he also wrote carried along by the Holy Spirit about the revelation of Jesus Christ on the Isle of Patmos. Verse 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was revealed, and, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What was going on at the time was that there were some false teachers some wolves in sheep's clothing, who denied that God had came in the flesh. They were teaching falsely that he did not come, that he was not incarnate, but Jesus did. And his disciples, they heard the truth that Jesus taught. And not only that, they, they saw the authority that the Son of God had taught with. And they also had saw his grace in his earthly ministry. They also saw his love in his earthly ministry. They saw his mercy too while he walked the earth. And when someone sees or witnesses something with their own eyes, once they, once they do that, you can't force them to say that it wasn't true. You can't force them to say that they didn't see it, that they didn't hear it when they did. The disciples touched Jesus Christ. They heard him speak. They saw him for themselves after his resurrection from the dead, after he was raised. And it, that very fact proves that God has eternal life and that it is with his son. That eternal life came with Jesus Christ and it, again that it came from the Father. Remember that having eternal life is this very fact, that it is, it is everlasting, that it is forever and ever and ever. Realize that our souls were created to live forever, either with God in heaven or away from God, separated from Him for all of eternity. But eternal life is this. It's forever and ever and ever with us 
and God. The question is, do you have eternal life? Do you have it this morning? That gift that God gives us. Verse 2 says this, that the life was manifested to us. And if someone wants assurance of their salvation, there's no other book in the Bible than that of 1 John. I'm not speaking about looking at someone else and saying, are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? But no, if you need assurance of salvation, are you saved? Look at the book of 1 John and see in it how it describes a born-again believer in God. You know, when I was first came to Christ, I would look at other people and I cared about them. I wanted them to be saved. I wanted to make sure that they knew Christ. If they were to die, because I've seen so many perish, you see them one day and the next day you don't. But this is not about that. This is about you knowing, you having assurance of salvation. Do you see these things in your own life? What an awesome book that God had John to write. What does saving faith look like? Well, in one sense, it's a life that is not, someone's life that is not, characterized with sinning. That's true. It, but on the other hand, it's about a fellowship with God and about the gift of what Jesus Christ has done in our lives and our appreciation of it. Gift. The word fellowship means gift. And, and from that, we're out to have joy. And and I went out to eat with a, a few people we know and we're just sharing our testimony. We're eating dinner and something just came over me. And you know the joy of the Lord is our strength. Of all the grace that He's shown in our life, the things that God has done, there should be joy in our life because of all that He has done for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Having the gift of eternal life, Matthew wrote about it in his gospel, about finding a treasure in a field, about finding a pearl and having that pearl. You and I having eternal life, we need to understand, is the greatest treasure to ever have in this world. It's like having or possessing even just one genuine pearl. Anyone ever seen the difference between a genuine pearl and the look of that and the clarity in that? compared to one that is not. So eternal life is something precious, something of superlative worth, like a genuine pearl that someone would have. And we should want others to be seeing, stretching their neck to see that pearl of great price. We should want others to be seeing the treasure that's in Christ, that salvation is from Jesus Christ and Him alone. And it, because it's been made known to us, it has been made clear to us that salvation from sin is with the Lord and only with Him. Do you have it this morning? Do you have eternal life? I love what John says. We, we've seen it. We've heard it. We've touched Jesus after the resurrection from the dead. And now we proclaim it to you. What we've seen, what we've heard, what He's done. And so let me encourage you, don't be in unbelief this morning. Do you have eternal life? Or not. Don't fall into the pit and split hell wide open if you don't. Look at verse 5. Same text. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. What does that mean? What does darkness mean? Well, it has a few different meanings, I find. It's Darkness can mean this, someone not understanding the ways of God. God is light. And someone being in darkness, they don't understand Him or who He is or His ways. That God is holy and how that sin is sin. Sin is the problem. There's a serious problem with it. But there is also a cure. There's also a remedy. And that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23 speaks of that dilemma, that problem. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Meaning, if you wanted to put it this way, that all for, fall short of who God is. Now, I, I learned what sin means. If you were to shoot at a bullseye and the very center 
and everyone would try as hard as they could, maybe in a religion or doing something they think is good and right for God. And so you shoot that arrow, and the, the difference between the bullseye and where we hit more often than not, and mostly all the time, so because we do fall short, the, the, the difference between the center, the bullseye, and where we hit, if you will, is called the sin. And the Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God or of who God is. So we need a Savior. Without Christ, man's sinfulness fills out into everything they do. It affects everything. Attitude, speech, things that are in the heart, it affects everything. Isaiah 24, verse 5 to 6 says this, The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants. For they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Again, but there is a cure, and there is eternal life. And it is with Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Eternal life was manifested, the scripture says. It was revealed to us. And truly, I believe that someone having saving faith in Jesus Christ, there's another fellowship that John the Apostle is speaking about. It's speaking about the church. It's speaking about those who you don't have to go get, not judging anybody, but they're here already. It's speaking about a fellowship, a partnership that we have with one another, laboring and serving God together. That fellowship is important to have. John later said they went out from us, because they were not of us. That's the reason they went out from us. There was no common common uh, uh, heart or mind or common things that they believed. Sometimes people just leave. Church, we must tell others to respond to God the right way, to repent of their sin, which means they have a change of mind. Now, I gave a handout back there. And I know you might have heard of the Romans Road or taken other courses in evangelism. But I love what John said. He said, what we've seen and heard, we proclaim it to you. And it's as simple as this. YesJesusLovesMe.com, and there's a few other. The ABCs of leading someone to Christ. First and foremost, A, someone has to admit they're a sinner. They have to admit it. They, I'm a sinner. I need I, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then they have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins. And then C, they need to confess him as Lord and Savior. What does that mean? What does that mean? That if you were to tap them after, I've led uh, many people in the back of the sanctuary as they're walking out, do you know Christ as your Savior? If you were to die right now, do you know him? And then I say when we pray and God uses me to help them see in the scriptures. Now when you walk out of here, if someone were to tap you on the shoulder and ask you, are you saved? You tell them who you believe in, right? You confess him. You confess him before men. You confess him to him that he's your Lord and Savior. What do you need from Jesus today? Is it for him to save your soul? Is it? Call on him and tell him what you want. Is that what you need this morning, right from where you're sitting? Do you need Jesus to save your soul? And then when we believe in Jesus, he brings someone into a place of safety, pulls you in forever and ever and ever because of your faith in Christ. Because you're trusting in the shed of blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And there is eternal worth in that. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 32, verse 1, he said, Blessed is the one, blessed, happy is the one whose sins are covered or forgiven, and that God will not take into account. So why all this this morning? A few weeks ago, I'm not really big on handouts, but I offered up a handout to write out your own salvation testimony. What was your life like before Christ? When did you come to faith in Christ? What, do you what did you believe about him? And how has your life been changed, transformed? But this morning, I, give, I hand out to you this, simply. It's all scriptural. The ABCs of leading someone to Christ. And we're going we're gonna to go into what they ought to believe, unless they believe in vain. So the Apostle Paul uses the word darkness. God is light. He's using the word darkness. He's showing the difference between the two, the two polar opposites, between God being holy and describing a way of sin and sinning. And again, he says, what we've seen and heard we proclaim to you. And what did the apostles do? 
they would simply speak about Jesus. That's it. They would sit down and speak. You have a few minutes? Let me tell you about someone I know. Let me tell you about someone who loves me. Let me tell you about someone whose grace is everlasting. Let me tell you about him. Sitting with Anna again with this couple. We don't know where they're at. I'm not judging them. I don't think the book of 1 John, again, is to look at other people and say, well, I, they don't have that character. No, it's about us knowing, but we just shared our testimonies, where we came to faith in Christ. What is someone to believe? Simply this. 1 Corinthians claims to be the gospel and the good news that everyone must believe. Now I make known to you, verse 1, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, which you also stand by, which you also are saved, if you, if you hold firmly to the word which I preach to you. And what is it? Unless you believe in vain. For I handed down to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And you know what? Not only that, He was seen by people. More than 500 brethren at one time, brothers and sisters in Christ, saw Him, heard Him. That's the gospel which somebody ought to believe. And church, we need to make sure to proclaim the good news to other people. The ABCs of salvation. Everyone can do this. There were years ago I did an evangelism explosion course, really in-depth, really intricate, kind of cumbersome. You know, it's just, what's a simple way to share Christ with someone? What do they need to, to, to do? It's all biblical. Admit they're a sinner. You say, well, have you ever lied? Have you ever cheated? Have you ever thought a bad thought? Have you ever gotten angry? Then you've sinned. Then you, and you've broken, if you've broken one part of the law, you've broken all of it. And what do you need to do then when you know that you need a Savior, that you know you're a sinner? You need to believe in the one who died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And then you need to believe, confess him as your Lord and Savior. You need to understand that he died and rose again for you, and he came to give you newness of life. And it will take away confusion. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one come to the Father but through me. There's no other way. There's not multiple ways. There's only one way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and everyone needs him as their Savior. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How long is everlasting life? How long is eternal life? It's forever and ever and ever and forevermore. Do you have it this morning? And if you have it, share it with somebody else. Share the good news with someone else this morning. Tell them about your Lord and Savior. That's why we're here as a church. Realize that someone's life is empty and unfulfilled without eternal life. Realize that. Without, without eternal life, without Jesus, it's empty. That there's a hole in their hearts that has, is, 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 it's like a God-shaped vacuum that he can only fill. I realize this, and I'll be gentle. If you were to look at Jesus' ministry, he had 12 disciples, right? 12. One of them went through the motions. One of them was there. One of them said he believed. One of them had their own agenda. The other 11 knew Christ. One did not. So let me ask you a question this morning. Do you truly know Christ as your Savior? He's the only one that can fill that God-shaped vacuum in you. In you, possessions cannot fill it. Worldly possessions can't do it. Success in the world cannot do it, cannot fill it. I don't know how many times I've ministered to men and I said, wow, you know, you're coming to church or people come into church and praise the Lord and they need a job and we pray for a job and then they, they have a choice whether to work on the Lord's day or not. And I'm not putting anybody down and they jump right at it. Success in the world can't fill it. It won't fill it. It won't. Religion won't fill it in someone's heart. You don't need. And on the other hand, you don't need to graduate from some evangelistic training program before you can share Christ. You can share it simply, A B C. A B C. We should be willing to share of the hope that's in Jesus, and do that every day. Share how that someone can have a relationship with God and spend eternity with God. And maybe I'm preaching you, to you this morning. I can get up on a tractor, a John Deere tractor. I can about turn the air on, shut the door, right? 
but I don't know what to do after that. I can sit on that tractor. It doesn't make me a farmer. Or I can answer a phone like in an insurance agent's office. Hi, thank you for calling State Farm. But I can't answer the questions. I'm not an insurance agent. I'm sitting in the insurance agent's office, maybe even at the front desk. doesn't make me an insurance agent. Or I can go out onto the Major League Baseball field. They give me a chance to stand up at the plate. I stand up there. I made it. I'm, I'm on the field. I love baseball, by the way. But that still doesn't make me a Major League Baseball player. Now, Billy Sunday, an evangelist, speaking of baseball players, he got saved, came out of being a baseball player, and became a preacher of salvation to people. If you didn't know about him, look him up. He was a Billy Sunday, a promoter of temperance, of abstinence from alcohol. It was at a time it was ravishing the land. It was against, you know, he was against it. He said that it should be pushed back into hell. So, and he preached, and one of the most important sermons that he ever preached was um, to get on the water wagon, to get off the booze. And he convinced many people to quit drinking. But he also said this quote that's been heard over and over again. He said that someone going to church doesn't make them a Christian any more than going to a garage makes someone an automobile. Someone's church membership can't save them. Only you believing in Jesus Christ can save you. Turning from sin can save you. That's it. Someone's denominational affiliation can't save you. Can't make you fit for heaven. And maybe I'm preaching to someone else here. Someone taking the bread and the cup. Repeating a prayer. Taking the bread and cup faithfully. All the time. You're here every time we do communion. That can't save you. There's no such thing as transubstantiation. It's heretical. It doesn't become the actual body and blood of Christ. That can't save you. Church membership can't. Let the deliberating be over this morning. You say, well, I look at these, this way of leading someone to Christ. I need it myself. I need to know for sure that I've trusted in Him. And there is a true light that shines. The deliberating should be over. And it's on front of the gospel train. When we moved from Chicago and left everything to come out here, uh, we live close to here. We had a deal for the house, fell through, sterling long story. But we were sleeping on an air mattress, and I had the babies, and I had the dogs, and, and I went to the library in uh, Heglish, I think it was, and we got an old video. It's actually a Christian. And they would sing, get on board, you know, the gospel train, get on board. And, we, I, and my kids loved it, so I, I, it would ring in my head all the time. Get on board. The deliberating should be over. All aboard this morning. Take that first step. You do that and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And let there be a great exchange at the cross. You bring your, your sins from the past. You bring them there. And then what God does is a big word. He imputes Christ's righteousness unto you. And then you're fit for heaven. Not church membership. Not taking, the, not taking communion. Not being a part of a denomination. They're good and all that. Only Christ imputed righteousness in you because of your faith in Him will make you fit for heaven. Just because of that. So if you get a chance as you walk out this morning, Pick up the ABCs of leading someone to Christ. Realize what the gospel is. It, it can be John 3.16. It is John 3.16. But it's really 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he was buried according to the scripture. And raised from the dead the same way. It was God's plan all along to save souls. Don't fall into the pit with unbelief. Don't do that. Don't split hell wide open. Don't do that. Can you say for sure this morning that you know him? And if you do, tell others what you've seen and heard, what you've witnessed in your life, God's grace in your life. Let me pray. Father, I, I, I know it's not in the order of service, but I ask you, don't let your word fall to the ground. 
someone wants to come to faith in Christ or come up and pray, the altar is open here. Let him cry out to you. Is that what you need? Call on the Lord. You need him to save your soul this morning? Tell the Lord what you want right from where you sit. And he'll save you to the uttermost. He'll put his spirit in you. He'll make the changes that you can't or you've tried to do in your life. He'll, he'll say, I'm the new way, not a religion. Have you done that? I hope you have. Get on board. All aboard. We're going to sing number 560. 560. You can stay seated. Give me a second to find it. Had an old deacon, and I said, uh, Monroe, what should I tell him this morning? And he was kind of right here, and he had can end up dying of cancer. But anyway, I said, what should I tell him, Monroe? What should I tell him, George? He said, tell him about Jesus. That's what we're going to sing about right now. So you tell him about Jesus. Um, can you play through 561 quick? Thank you. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story it is pleasant to in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and sorry, his love. I love to tell the story it is pleasant to repeat. Seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best, seem hungry and thirsting to hear it like a and when in seams of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story be my in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. Father, I pray for the people of church to accept you this week. And I pray that you want to stay in our meeting. Father, we 
Thank you. 